Good morning and welcome to another Micrographics live webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Carl van Royen. I will be your host today and we will be covering the What's new July update for Fusion 360? And uh, included in this in this presentation, we will also be having some honourable mentions, honourable mentions from previous updates. As I said, my name is Carl van Royen. I'm an application engineer with Micrographics. My email is at the bottom of the slide here. If you do wish to contact me with regards to any questions on the updates or support. So as I mentioned, today's webinar, we'll be looking at Fusion 360, what's new within the July update, and then some honorable mentions from previous updates. On today's agenda, we will start off with a intro to the Fusion 360 update environment, and a little bit about sort of the update process. We'll then move on to looking at specifically what was included in the July update, concentrating mostly on the design environment and the manufacturing environment. These are the two environments that I deal with the most with customers. So I feel you know, the customer base that we're watching this would uh, take a lot away from that. And uh, I will also point you towards the What's New Update blog directly from Autodesk if you wish to see any other information with regards to what is new. So we'll be looking at uh, July updates for design environment as well as for the manufacturing environment. And then we will move on to some honorable mentions from previous updates going back to um, January this year, November last year, before we close off with a quick summary and Q&A. So for our intro, if we have a look at Fusion 360 itself and the way that Fusion 360 updates, it runs through a live updating process, <clears throat> which is very useful for a, uh, let's say, your design office administrator and your, your CAD administrator. <clears throat> Normally, when they hear about software needing to be updated, they think about a lot of downtime, a lot of lost production time. And so it's always a pain to have to run updates. If you think of software like Inventor or AutoCAD, every year there's a major release. And as the office goes through that upgrade process to the next release, there is downtime as those computers are being upgraded. And then every time there is a update, the users or the CAD or the IT administrator or IT technician has to go and then run those updates. Now, Fusion is different. Fusion does not have a year-on-year -year release. When you download and install Fusion, you have the latest version of Fusion available to you. And if there's a release after your initial installation, in uh, Fusion 360, will install that update automatically when you open up Fusion 360. So if there is an update that gets released tonight, then when opening Fusion 360 after that update is released, it will automatically download and install that update. The only thing required for the end user is to restart Fusion 360. And typically that's going to happen at the end of the workday anyway. They'll close down Fusion, the next morning they come in, they open up Fusion, they have the latest version. And this is nice because the development team can then push out major updates on a regular interval, um, almost monthly, which would be some mix of bringing in new features, maybe their feature improvements, or it could be a small fix, uh, could just be a small bug fix that gets rolled out. And what we've seen kind of over the past is roughly sort of every two months, we're getting releases where new features are brought in. And uh, there's been times where almost even weekly, there've been bug fixes rolled out uh, to fix any known issues. 
So it's this nice continuous process of updating the software automatically in the background where the user does not have to put any effort in to keep the software updated. So with that being said, what we're going to look at is what was brought to us in the latest major update. Uh, that was the July update that was rolled out. So the July update was a quality of life update. It was quite a major update. It was aimed at improving the overall quality of life of the user. And a lot of usability updates were rolled into this, um, into this update that was brought out. These updates spanned across almost all the workspaces, but I will be specifically looking at the modeling workspace, generative design, drawings, and then the manufacturing workspace comprising of milling, tool libraries, CAM simulation, post-process, and five axis updates. But there is a complete list of updates you can see on the right hand side of the screen. There is the contents for the July 2022 product update, What's New? That is the uh, blog, that, the official Autodesk blog that has been put up with all of this information outlined nicely within that blog. So we're going to have a look, starting off with modeling, uh, what was brought to us. And we're starting off with a new feature that was brought into the sheet metal environment, and that is the ability to create a lofted flange. Uh, those of you who are inventor users would know what lofted flange allows you to do. But for those who have solely worked in Fusion 360, uh, this will be the first time that you are seeing this. What it allows you to do is it allows you to create two sketches and then select those two sketches and create a transition between the two. The name leads to this, the lofted option. It's very similar to the way loft would work, but it generates a sheet metal component. So once you have selected those two profiles, you'll get a preview of the shape that is required and you'll have various settings. Part of this allows you to choose whether you want the part to be a brake form part. So we see here in the image on the slide, a press brake is used to create the bends in this part. So that is your brake form. I'll come back to the die form. Uh, we'll have a look at the image there on the die form. But when it's in brake form, we have the ability to change the amount of facets. So how many times is this bent to create the shape that's required? There are various options for facet control. You can see on the right hand side there, there are four icons where you can adjust things like your chord tolerance, your facet angle, uh, even the number of facets. So you would choose your specific option there. And it pulls the thickness from the sheet metal rule. You'll see there you can choose on the drop down uh, on the right hand side what sheet thickness this material needs to be. And as I said, coming back to the die form option, I'm just going to go to the next image. We can see here, die form allows you to create a smooth transition. Essentially, this component would have to be created by pressing two dies together, male and female die, to create that smooth transition, uh, much like some pop elbows are generated. So that is the lofted flange option. That is part of the flange command. So when you activate the flange command at the top of the command, you'll choose whether you want to create a standard flange or a uh, lofted flange. Moving on, we are going back into just your standard design workflow uh, within the modeling tab, or sorry, within the modeling workspace. And this uh, update brought us the automated modeling public preview. So part of ongoing process of improving the software, public previews will come out, which allow you to preview functionality that the development team wants to bring into the software and give your feedback on that preview. So what automated modeling allows you to do, it allows you to quickly create complex shapes to connect existing geometry, while at the same time avoiding other geometry. This uses the generative design technology to generate the shape that is required 
However, you only need geometric inputs. You don't require anything like your forces, constraints, materials, or manufacturing processes. All you need to do is you say, okay, I want to connect these three faces. In this case, I have the two disks that are being connected to the slot-shaped plate on the right-hand side. And then it needs to avoid the red cylinder. Then it will generate a set of previews for you. And uh, there we'll see the alternatives, a couple of design alternatives. In this case, it came up with six alternatives. You would select the alternative that you, you want. Uh, so let's say the alternative number, number one, we want to see a preview of that. Selecting alternative number one will show you the preview in the window. So here we have one alternative and we may look at a second alternative and you can go through the alternatives and then eventually choose the one that you want. When you select the alternative that you are happy with it then generates a T-spline body. You can see on the bottom left of the screen that icon, the first icon there shows the automate feature which allows you to go back and edit the feature. Then the second and third icons show you the form that is created and the combine of the form to the existing solids. And this allows you to go back and edit that, that feature at any point in time. Also being based on a form, you can access a T-spline body, you can go and access that T-spline form and edit it directly and make changes to it, neaten it up, smooth it out, do whatever you need to do with that body. Then moving on to the uh, moving on to the next update, we're looking at an update to the product design extension. Uh, so this is an extension that you can purchase access to and it will unlock tools required for designing more complex parts more specifically to aimed at plastic part design, but there are tools in there that can be used throughout your design process and uh, are quite useful. And the specific update that we're looking at here is the REST command, which is has been added to the plastic tab. And the REST command allows you to use a sketch. That sketch may be created on a work plane through the part. And the sketch is then used to create a flat surface or a flat resting plane on a curved surface. So we can see here that the sketch is both outside of the existing part and it then extends inwards below the surface of that part. And once the command is activated, the material above the sketch is removed from the part added material below the sketch creating that flat surface. Now you'll see there are some grips there in that central image that you can use to adjust the part of that rest as well as the draft angle for the faces created above and below that rest. Once you have manipulated those faces as needed you can then accept that and it creates that rest on the face. That flat area can be used uh, as a flat spot to maybe insert a piece of hardware, uh, nuts or bolts to screw components together. Uh, it can also be used for stacking purposes if the object is going to stack on top of this and the feet need a flat area to rest on. Various uses for that command. Moving on to more improvements within the modeling environment within that um, product design extension. We're looking at improvements to the snap fit command. Uh, so for those of you who may not be aware of it, the snap fit command allows you to quickly and easily add uh, hooks and snaps into a model. Typically when you have two plastic casings or two halves of a plastic casing, you have to sn uh, snap together would be able to use this command to then add those snap fit. 
And so the improvements to this command allow for the choice of automatic or manual selection modes for placement. If you're set to automatic, the snap fit command will automatically select all the points within a visible sketch to add your snap fits to those points, where manual allows you to manually go and choose which points in that sketch you want to add your snaps to. What they've also done is they have also updated the rotation type or the rotation command. So you are now able to rotate snap fits independently. You can see there on the image on the bottom left, each rotation um, snap, or each snap fit there has its own rotation grip that you can grab and you can rotate. And this is, and this allows you to, or should I say, you're allowed to do this through the selection of the independent rotation type. That would allow you, to, allow you to rotate each snap fit independently. Uniform, the first option that is uh, shown there on the right hand side, that would align all of the grips in the same direction. And if you rotate 90 degrees, they will all rotate 90 degrees. Aligned allows you to align each individual grip to a specific surface face or edge to allow you to get that angle that may you may not uh, know exactly what it is, but you can align to that angle to align with your, uh, your snap fit. So just improvements to the snap fit command there on the placement of the snaps and the alignment of the snaps. Moving on from the snap fit and from that product design extension, we're looking at generative design and in the generative design environment they have included a couple of updates i'm just going to highlight these two here um, previously you were able to create generative models that was included a while back and being able to create different generative models allowed you to create different variations of your design and different variations of outcomes. But the problem with this is that it made the explore process quite complex. And what they've included now is a filter that allows you to filter out your results and it simplifies the explore process. You can see on the right hand side there the outcome filters you can choose whether you want to see all the models for, in this case, generative model one and generative model two, or you can deselect a specific model so that when you are exploring your outcomes, you are only seeing outcomes for one or a set of those generative models that were selected. Then in the fluid path study, they have updated the fluid path study terminology where we see that there was confusion between the specific uh, types or the specific commands. Uh, we had preserved geometry, but there was confusion. Was it the solid geometry or was that the fluid geometry that had to be preserved? So the preserved geometry command has now been renamed to fluid preserved geometry. That is the fluid that you want to keep in the study. Where And where obstacle geometry was the solid geometry that needed to be avoided that has now been renamed to solid obstacle geometry. And the same with your starting shape, your fluid starting shape, uh, that was just called starting shape. Now was that your fluid or your solid? It has now been more specifically named fluid starting shape. And then the same with the obstacle offset, that would be the material that is containing the fluid and that has become your solid obstacle offset command. You can see there on the right hand side, the renaming and the drop down in product. So those are the new names there, just to avoid any confusion on those um, names of those commands within the fluid path study environment. Moving on to drawings, there were a couple of updates within the drawing environment. 
And uh, one of the bigger updates, or one of the nicer updates, is the ability to change the fonts within the title block. Up until this update, the font was a standard fixed font, and you weren't able to customize that and change it. But now what you're able to do is you're able to edit your title block. So you'll go into your edit title block mode. You'll double click on an attribute to edit the attribute. And within the attribute editing dialog box, you will be able to change the font. So this now allows you to match your company standards a lot closer and you can standardize your templates in Fusion 360 a lot easier um, with this. Also within the drawing environment, the uh, title block and border move behavior has been updated. In the past, if you dragged a window over some objects in your model or in your drawing and you click to drag and move them, if your title block or your border was selected by accident, it would drag as well. It would shift off the page. And so now you cannot drag the title block or the border with the mouse. So if it is accidentally selected, or even if you purposefully select it and click and drag, it will not move. You have to explicitly use the move command. And from within the move command, select the title block or the border. One last update to cover here in the drawing environment is uh, DXF export. We've seen in the past that a DXF is exported in uh, three dimension. Uh, we would actually see, if you look on the image on the right hand side there, those views are actually represented by three dimensional CAD. And so the DXF, were, the DXF was difficult to work with and it was uh, difficult to read and the export wasn't always the best. So now the DXF export has now been flattened. So part of the export process, it automatically flattens to create a actual 2D DXF. There would be no geometry in the Z direction, no offset geometry in the Z. Okay. That would be updates for the drawing environment. And we'll then move on to the manufacturing environment, looking at a couple of different sections within the manufacturing environment. So the first section we'll look at is updates to the milling environment. Yeah, we see uh, specifically an update to the show toolpath data updates. This is actually a toolbox that I had missed previously within other updates. So on the left hand side here, just showing you how to access this toolbox, you would choose a toolpath, right click on it, and in the right click menu, there's the ability to show toolpath data. What this does is it brings up a toolpath dialog box, which shows you essentially line for line what is happening within your toolpath. So there we see the movement type, the coordinates, what movement it is, or whether it's cutting, leading in, leading out, feed rates and RPM. Now in this dialog box on the right hand side, what they have done is they've added new filters and this aids you in the visualization of your toolpath. So here on the right hand side, I've uh, filtered according to levels and you will see in the main dialog box, there is the level of Z minus 10 that is highlighted. So selecting a line that is at that Z minus 10 level would highlight all those lines that match that level. And you'll see also the hide and selected option is enabled there. So what this is doing is by selecting a, a line of code, essentially, at Z minus 10, which is a cutting movement, all of those cutting movements at that Z level are highlighted. If I just skip to the next image, we can see what you would actually see in the model. So you would have the dialog box open, and as you pick within that dialog box, your model will automatically update to show you the toolpath data of that specific selection. And this just enables you to quite easily go through your toolpath and inspect your toolpath at a specific level within the design.
Moving on to the next milling update, uh, you are now able to set a exit position. So we see there on the left hand side with the linking tab where you would normally set your pre-drill or entry positions, you are now able to set an exit position for your tool. And this is typically used where, well this is used to essentially <clears throat> control your lead out to a predefined point. Uh, what this does is it prevents the tool from retracting uh, from inside of an undercut. So if you're using a lollipop or a slitting tool, you would be able to control that tool so that it retracts or leads out to a set point so that the tool clears the geometry <clears throat> and then retracts up. This command is available for 2D adaptive, 2D pocket and 2D contour. The next update that we'll look at is the measure from Active WCS. This actually came in handy with a customer of mine not so long ago and where they had an issue with their setup, they misunderstood a option with their stock setup and they needed to take a measurement from where they had already set up their coordinate system to the center of their component. They had manufactured the part accidentally with a offset. Uh, they thought that their center point on their stock was aligned with the center point on their part, but unfortunately it wasn't. And so here we were able to go and measure uh, using the inspect tab, selecting the measure command, are able to measure from the active setup WCS and that will give you measurements in relation to your setup, your coordinate system. And in this case, they were able to confirm that they did in fact have a offset between their coordinate system that they had set up, their WCS and the center of their component. So this is quite a useful tool in inspecting especially when you have Fusion open and you are working on the machine and you need to know your X, Y coordinates between two specific points or from your WCS to a specific point on the model. You're able to quite easily measure from that. So it's changing your origin point of that measurement. Then an enhancement to steep and shallow. So for those of you that have the machining extension and are using steep and shallow, uh, you are now able to choose to machine steep regions or shallow regions only. So in the past, if you used steep and shallow, it would automatically generate toolpath for both steep and shallow regions. And now you are able to use the steep and shallow command only on steep regions or only on shallow regions or both. There'll be a drop down that allows you to choose that. And so we'll see there, Within the passes tab, you've got recognize areas as with the drop down, steep and shallow, steep only or shallow only. Uh, there is another option as well, which has been included with the scallop for shallow areas. You are, now have the ability to choose whether that scallop will be machined inside out or outside in. Essentially, whether you want the scallop to start in the center and work outwards for inside out start on the perimeter and work inwards outside again. <clears throat> okay, still with the milling updates, uh, there's been updates to the chamfer command. The chamfer command now has the ability to preserve order and uh, you may have seen this in other commands as well but essentially preserve order will machine the chamfers within the order that you selected them when selecting edges to chamfer. So if you select edge A, B, C and you enable preserve order, it will machine them in A, B, C. Preserve order deselected, the software will then optimize the cut order to reduce machining time. So it may machine A, C, B, may change the order. There's also a new option, a new drop down for outer corner mode where you can allow the tool path to either uh, keep sharp corners or roll around a corner. Now the 
two images that we have there with the green stock and the toolpath. The bottom one shows us the keep sharp corner. And so the machine will, in this case, make a 90 degree turn with a zero radius in the corner where the roll around corner will roll the tool around the corner with a specific radius. And uh, this will be easier on the machine, it's especially for older machines. Um, however, that may have a tendency to damage the corner of the chamfer as it rolls around that corner. So the keep sharp corner allows you to machine that corner without standing a chance of damaging it, damaging it as the tool rolls around. And then lastly for the milling section, looking at uh, the option to hide the warnings. So as you are creating your tool paths, you would get warnings in your, in your uh, model browser and this now within the <clears throat> warnings dialog box, errors and warnings dialog box, you are able to choose to hide warnings and this will hide any warnings for any tool paths. And warnings are typically things that uh, you can get away with that are not going to cause any issues from a machining perspective. Uh, warning may be that you haven't selected your, uh, your coordinate system. Uh, maybe you've left it at zero instead of one. So you haven't chosen specifically G54 and it automatically chooses G54 for you. You would get a warning telling you that you haven't set your coordinate system, G54 will be used and hard warning would hide that type of warning. Uh, you may have chosen a tool that um, has coolant on as an option, but your machine doesn't have coolant. Let's say if you're using a router, you would get a warning saying that the machine doesn't support coolant. It would hide those sorts of warnings. Okay, moving on to the tool library itself, there are a couple of quality of life updates to the tool library. Uh, there is the, we have the option in a right click menu to remove unused tools. That option has now been added to the main tools banner. So we see there on the top right hand side, that little broom. What that does is any tools that are not being used in an operation within a document, they are removed from that document to clean up the document and leave only the used tools. Then we also have a link to download um, supplier tools in the tool library. So in the tool library, bottom left hand side, I believe, of the library, there is a link. When you click on that, it will take you directly to the Fusion 360 website with the tool uh, suppliers available for download. Uh, so on the right hand side here, I've put together a collage of all the different suppliers that have libraries available for Fusion. Uh, just to name a few, we've got Heimer, Goering, Maritool, Renishaw, Evical, Harvey Tool, uh, some of the bigger ones, there's Haas there as well, and uh, Sandvik, of course. So that now just makes it easier for you to find tools that are um, available for download rather than having to go on to Google, trying to search for them and find them directly there in the tool library. Then within your document library, uh, so you'll see there on the right hand side I have a document called Engrave V1 open with setup 2 active. Within the document library your tools will now display the operations that they are used within. So we can see there I have on the left hand side in the browser four operations selected. We have the engrave 2, engrave 3, trace and chamfer. They all use tool 50. On the right hand side we can see in the library tool 50 has a drop down arrow. You can click that to expand and that then shows you those operations that that tool is used in. So this way you can quite quickly and easily identify from within the tool library if the correct tool is being used for the correct operations. Just another improvement here on the tool library. 
uh, in the past, if you copied a sample tool or copied a tool from your own library and you paste that tool into the document so that you could use it, a duplicate would be pasted. So you would end up with two tool 50s within your document. And this could, this could be confusing um, as one of those tool 50s would be used for some operations and then the other tool 50 would be used for other operations. What happens now is when you paste that tool in, it will not duplicate that tool. It will see that tool 50 already exists and it will reuse that tool. So it reuses the existing tool in the document. And also that pasted tool, when you paste it in, it will be highlighted so that you can see the tool that was just pasted in. In the past, when you paste a tool into a library, it would just disappear into the library and you'd have to scroll through and find it again. And then just a last note here for the tool library is that they have improved the sample libraries. They have uh, updated some of the tools and they have included new tools within the sample libraries as well. Moving on to the simulation environment. Yeah, we see that uh, the CAM simulation, which has been updated quite a lot lately, has received its own tab now. So when you simulate your um, <clears throat> your tool parts, the ribbon at the top of the screen will change over to a CAM simulation uh, toolbar or tab. And what this is going to allow is it's going to allow for expansion, further expansion of the simulation environment as they bring more and more functionality to the simulation environment. Part of the functionality that they've brought in, as we can see on the image here, is the ability to create a cross-section or a section view within the simulation environment. So as you are simulating, you want to double check things like tool clearance or the quality of the machining at the bottom of the hole. You are able to create that section while the, pre while the simulation is running. Within the turning simulation environment, and actually you have seen this in the milling as well, you now have your spindle direction uh, display option. So on the view section of your simulation panel, there is the option to show spindle direction. And this is mainly for the turning for turning simulations so that you can see the direction that the spindle is turning. But I have seen that it does display as well in the milling environment as well. <clears throat> so you can confirm whether you have clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation on your spindle. Moving on to machine simulation, a small but really nice um, option that has been included is that when you are creating your machine in the machine builder, you have the ability to preview your machine movements. Now in the past, you had a slider where you just moved the slider between min and maximum. But what it actually what we see now in the highlighted red boxes it will display the actual position of the machine. You can even click there and put in a value to get the position and your model will display at that position. Then we also have the home tab or the home button to then remove that axis or move that axis back to its home position. So we have the ability there to preview the machine movements. <clears throat> And over and above this, we also have the ability now to hide construction geometry. So if you have drawn up a machine and you're in your machine builder or you've downloaded machine geometry within machine builder and machine simulation, you're able to then hide the construction geometry within that. So that could be work planes, work axes and points that can now be hidden within the machine simulation environment. And up to now, TCP machines have been supported. Now machine simulation supports non-TCP machines. Uh, just a note to make here with machine simulation, it still only supports milling. Uh, there's still yet no up updates for turning machine simulation. <clears throat> that being said, moving on to post-processing, we have seen the improvement of certain post-processes for milling. Uh, so we have a list there of post processes that have been updated and improved for milling, 
including some Heidenheim, Syntec, uh, Woodwop, UC, CNCs, and as well as the inclusion and uh, improvement of Herco machines. So there are now machine simulation models for 16 new Herco machines, as well as 11 of the existing Herco machines have been improved and updated. Staying with post-processing, there have been a couple of improved post-processors for turning. Uh, this also includes Doosan and Fanook post-processors, so they have been updated and improved. Uh, there have also been Doosan and Mazak updates for post-processors in the Milton environment as well. Then on the additive side, there is an improved ABB post-processor as well. So improvements on post-processing across the board with the various post-processors that have been updated. <clears throat> Moving on to 5-axis machining extension. Here we see improvements that uh, would only really affect customers that are using the machining extension. Uh, there have been large updates, or big updates to 5-axis capabilities. You'll now see that you will have 5-axis options available with collision avoidance for steep and shallow, parallel, scallop, pencil, spiral, radial, morph spiral, morph, and project. So all of these toolpaths that were 3-axis toolpaths have now been expanded with 5-axis options um, to be able to set um, your 5-axis options with collision avoidance. We'll see a note here though, lead and lean option is still currently only available for steep and shallow. Then we're moving on to the last section of the webinar, looking at previous updates, honorable mentions from previous updates. I'll go through these quite quickly as hopefully uh, some of these you should be aware of already, but some of them you may not have known were snuck in with the updates. The biggest one that was brought in this year is the Fusion 360 service utility. <clears throat> what this does or what it is, it's a utility that allows you to uh, repair your Fusion 360 installation. It allows you to reset all your settings uh, or uninstall your Fusion if you're having issues. It also has diagnostic options to gather network diagnostic information, computer diagnostics uh, related to your installation. And how do you launch it? Where do you find it? Um, if you try to launch Fusion twice and both attempts at launching Fusion fail, on the third attempt of launching Fusion, the, auto, uh, the service utility will automatically launch and give you options to um, as mentioned, give you options for repairing or resetting Fusion. Alternatively, when you launch Fusion 360 and you get the Fusion 360 uh, flash page that comes up, you can then push Control A to open up the diagnostics tool. And if you are on Mac, you push the Command A um, shortcut. And that will then bring up the uh, service utility. Then in the design environment, I think this was in January, the replace component command was brought in where you can right click and replace a component. It was then later updated with an option to be able to replace all instances of a component. So instead of individually going and selecting to replace each component individually, you can now do a replace all instance. When assembling, there is now the ability to create tangent relationships between components. This is very useful when creating uh, components such as cams with their followers or gears that are meshed. You're now able to create a tangent relationship between those components. There's no more need to create surface contacts or um, joint um, relationships. <clears throat> Then part of the sort of assembly environment is the read only for me option that has been improved, uh, brought in. This typically would be when you are wanting to open an assembly that somebody else already has open. 
Uh, Fusion does allow you the ability to, does allow users the ability to have multiple users opening an assembly and then working with subcomponents of that distributed design. This read only just takes that a step further, allows the user to open the assembly but put it into a read only mode. Uh, they may only want the assembly open as reference so that they want to just see what is going on in the assembly with their components. So read only mode puts it into read only for you so other users can work with that and edit and modify that assembly. Then over to drawings. You can now create auxiliary views from a base or projected view. And this allows just for quicker and easier creation of views that are at a weird or unknown angle. Uh, we're now able to also put whole tables into our drawings with identifiers to identify the holes, uh, essentially balloons with a item number or index number to index against the whole table. And the same with revision tables. So you're now able to add revision tables with revision markers, just a flag to mark where in the drawing the revision or change was made, as well as revision clouds that can be inserted into a drawing. Quick uh, one or two updates in the simulation environment. The event simulation type was split out into two different simulation types. We have quasi-static event simulation, which is essentially an event that happens slowly over time. Uh, so the name there, quasi-static, it's almost static. So this could be a vice clamping down onto a component or a uh, component being slowly forged into a shape. And then the second type is a dynamic event simulation. These are event simulations that are more instant. Uh, think of a ballistics testing, bullet strike against a plate, a vehicle hitting a barrier, or a drop test where a bottle or a cell phone is dropped onto the floor. Simulation results also now include reaction and contact force results. So when doing something like a static simulation of a bracket that's made up of a couple of components, you are now able to view reaction and contact forces between components within that assembly. Then generative design, you're able to now export multiple outcomes at once. No need to manually go to each outcome that you want and export. You can pick up to four outcomes and export those four outcomes. And our last page before we move on to our summary, we have some updates to NC programs. Uh, one last one here is when you select an NC program in your browser on the left of your screen, the operations that are used within that NC program will then be highlighted within the browser further down below the NC program. So you would see within the various setups that are included in the NC program, those operations will be highlighted. There is also the ability now to add a file name property when posting. Uh, so in the past, you only had program number where you would put in a number and that was used as the file name. We now have a separate property to enable the use of creating a or setting your own custom file name with a separate program number. And with milling, uh, going back all the way to November last year, machine simulation was introduced within the manufacturing environment. Uh, so that's an update going quite far back, and they've been improving on that ever since its release. And more recently, interactive axis tilting for your 3 plus 2 positioning has been included. Uh, so if you're doing any of your three axis commands operations like your uh, let's say parallel or adaptive clearing you're able to interactively tilt the axis using on-screen controls to adjust the rotation of the uh, model to set your new tool axis and part of this is the ability to enable accessibility analysis what this does is it will shade the machinable areas in green and the non-machinable areas in red when adjusting your tilting. Moving on to turning, there is an 
uh, there's been an update to the turning uh, commands when you are profiling the outside of your component. You are able to suppress uh, grooves. They call it groove suppression. What you would do is you would select the faces on the inside of the groove. And what this will do is it will machine the component, but it will then ignore that suppressed groove. Uh, so it would be as if that groove did not exist in the model. So this allows you to create certain uh, profiling tool parts that will not dig down and groove into the part, which then allows you to come back later with a more specific, let's say, grooving tool, and then groove that out with a subsequent tool part. Then the product design extension, I did mention some improvements to it earlier. That is the extension aimed at expanding your ability to design products, uh, which includes the snap fit commands as well as boss commands that was released in January. And since then they have improved on the boss command with the addition of a ribs tab. So now you can create bosses and then add ribs and strengthen it at the same time. Uh, then there's improved the snap fit command with visibility controls where you're able to set the opacity of the components being connected with the snap fit controls. And then there has been an inclusion of a design advice tool for injection molding that allows you to select a component and have it analyzed against a set of rules that has been set up within the environment. And this is mainly aimed at injection molding, looking at advice on how to make that part more manufacturable. Um, and areas in which that part could be improved. That will bring us to the end of the honorable, honorable mentions. We're now at the summary stage. Uh, basically, to sum up, you know, Fusion 360 has continued updates that run you know, almost on a monthly basis with uh, fixes. And from what I've seen recent history, is a almost bi-monthly uh, feature updates. Almost every second month, they are bringing out updates within or feature updates within the software, and this allows the development team to constantly improve the software. And through that automated update process, not feel as if they are interrupting the flow of work for their customers. Uh, they can roll out these updates and not cause downtime to the customers. And typically what we see within these updates are new features. Um, like I said, those sort of bi-monthly feature updates where you get new features and also where new previews may be brought in. Those previews enable the users to get early access to commands that they are looking at creating as fully fledged commands within the software and provide feedback and help improve that design process. And then as updates come through, those previews become graduated previews. They come out of the preview status and become a fully functional um, production feature within the software. All with very, well, basically no downtime to the customer as these updates are installed automatically when you launch Fusion. That brings us to the end of the session. I'll open up for any Q&A, any questions and answers, or any questions that require answers, and then I shall close off the, the webinar. <laughs> okay, we don't have any questions, so I will thank you for your attendance. Once again, my name is Carl van Royen. Uh, for micrographics and uh, thank you for attending and we hope to see you at the next live webinar thank you so much